Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their needs. Christ, you are the cornerstone. Lord, you are the rock upon all our hopes rest. Bring to completion all that you have begun and grant to us things needful and profitable for our salvation, that we might be people in whom you delight, through whom you show forth your mercy. Guard us, O Lord, against all that causes strife, those who act in violence and terror that threaten people everywhere, who seek to destroy the order of peace, Bless our servicemen and women and defend us at home and abroad. We pray for all police officers, firefighters, and emergency personnel who work on our behalf. Make our homes a place of blessing and love, O oh Lord, that husbands and wives may honor and the promise of marriage and faithfully take care of their children and give them the help and honor and the gifts of life from which you began from all creation. Where people suffer in body or spirit, heal them and give them peace, O Lord. Sustain the weary with your word and grant those who are ill that healing power that comes from above by your will. We lift up those before you in these names that have requested prayer. We pray for Marjorie Hendershot, Doris Stam, Lucille Simmons, Sue Jansen, Marcia Thompson, Nikki Lavalier, Andy Segabrook, David Schaefer, Shirley Forbes, uh, James Capanello, Ron Hampton, the family of Lauren Smith, pastor, husband of Pastor Donna Smith, and Leah McDowell. We pray for all those who are upon your hearts this morning. Lord, be with these people in their hour of need and comfort them that they may overcome their struggles and get receive relief from their pain and their grief. Teach us to Lord to love, Lord, and above all things to love you. All these things we pray in our Lord's name, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom you reign, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated.
lessons. Our first lesson is Isaiah 43, verses 16 to 21. This is what the Lord says, He who made a path through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, an army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a whip. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing new things. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I have formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. And our second lesson is from Philippians 3, verses 8 to 14. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. But I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which has come through the faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, brothers self yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. This ends the lessons. And this time we invite our choir to come on up.
the parable of the tenants. He, that is Jesus, went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. And at harvest time, he sent, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant. But that one also they beat and threatened shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. He sent him still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and, and give the vineyard to others. And when the people heard this, they said, May this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what does it mean of what which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But when they were afraid, keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch Jesus in something that he said so that they might hand him over to the power and the authority of the governor, the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lord. Good morning. God's grace and peace be with you this morning and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We welcome you this morning. Have you ever noticed that some people just never grasp new things very well? You know, you confront them with a new idea, a new concept, or even a new invention that uh, they've never been exposed to before. And they may have, uh, uh, they have problems with this. And Jesus today may have had the same problem with the folks that he was talking to today. There was oil in Oklahoma. And there was a man who had some property and he was an old man, and he had searched all his life. And this, this man was very poor. And there on his land, he found some oil. And he became very wealthy very, very quickly. And one of the finest things that this old man did was he bought himself a great big Cadillac. Yeah, and he would take that Cadillac, could you imagine, and get in that Cadillac and go driving all around town. And he wanted to have the biggest and the longest Cadillac that he could ever get. So he even added four extra spare tires to the back of the Cadillac to make sure that it was extra, extra long. And he bought, you know, one of those Abraham Lincoln tall hats. And he would wear that. And he would wear a bow tie. And he would completely outfit himself in a tux with tails. And he had a cigar. And he would ride around town in that Cadillac through the whole town. He wanted everybody to see him. He was a real friendly soul. 
And he would turn to everyone in town, laugh and write, and he'd wave. And he'd speak to all the folks. They had, they had like a little restaurant like we have here in town. And he would go to the restaurant and he would meet everybody. And he was really friendly. And it, it was amazing. And, and it was true, but um, nobody ever noticed. Nobody uh, ever knew, like, about his property. And you ever wonder why? Why would that happen? It was because directly in the front of his big, beautiful Cadillac car were two horses pulling it. Some people never grasp new things. And neither did this man. Sometimes we have to be very patient to explain it to them. There was a friend who worked in construction. And one summer uh, during seminary, the work was hard. And he worked a good job and he was paid a good pay. And uh, he was out in the dust and, and uh, out of a stuffy classroom and uh, in his life. And uh, to some people, this would be a foreign piece of work, going uh, out and being in a classroom and then turning around and doing construction. And he got away from some of the seminary curriculum and he got into this building project. And the project that he was involved in was a six-story apartment complex. And he had to do a lot of the masonry work uh, within that complex. Well, it was kind of a learning process for this young man. And uh, it was on-the-job training. And he would learn as he went along. And you could imagine all the bricklayers there, the masonry people there, and, and he was glad to be the newbie ready to help. He was the new guy. And so one of the construction people said that there was a door that needed to go on the corner. And would this seminary student who was working construction would he go look for the left-hand door studs that opened inward? And so he was looking for those left-hand door studs that would move the door inward. And, and he looked, and, and, and he looked, and for the better part of the day, he looked, and there were amused smiles on some of the masonry people's faces. And some of you who are in construction, I can see out there, you're starting to smile. And finally, the foreman came up to him. And with a gleam in his eye, and a smile, and a tugging on the corner of his mouth, he took this friend aside, and with patience, and with a great deal of self-restraint, explain something to him. And it was like, there's really no such animal. There's no such animal as a left-handed door stud that opens inward. And despite the drawing that his friend helped for him to find it, it was hard to grasp that new thing. And especially since that new thing are not part of our past experience. My friend uh, went to the seminary library, and he could find anything in there. But on a construction site, it was a whole new world. He was lost for a long while. And it took time to explain things to him, to show him things around, to show him what to do and to how to do it, and to help him understand what was to be expected. And it sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? But this is exactly what was happening 
with Jesus Christ. Jesus was like the foreman, and he's with his friends, and they had this limited understanding of what God was all about. God, through Jesus, that, that teacher and that preacher and that showing, and that he healed the people, and he did a lot of healing all throughout the countryside. He said, look, this is what God does. God is helping the poor and healing the blind and healing the lame and the lepers. Jesus went around playing with children and he got down and he looked at them and he said, look here, look at this child. This is what God is all about. Unless you have faith and love like this little one and trust like this little child, you can't grasp it well. And I can teach you. Jesus went around talking to, to winos and prostitutes and cheats and tax collectors. And he said, look here, God loves you and God cares about you. And you are an important person because you too are one of these children. And Jesus went around telling stories about taking up inheritance and going out into the world and blowing it off. And in the end, after shopping with the pigs, going home to your father who is waiting there ready to celebrate. He told these stories about lost sheep and a shepherd who risked his life and limb to find that lamb. People had trouble grasping what God was all about and how God deals with people and how they are to be shown and be told over and over again that because God is so great and so understanding, we are so limited by our experiences of the past our idea of God and his expansiveness, we will never truly be able to comprehend how great God is. And that's why we're here, isn't it? It's why we're all gathered here to hear again the story of God loving us, to try to grasp more about the greatness of God, that we struggle to understand and how to deal with God, you and me, in our everyday lives and, and, and to relate it to those who are around us. So Jesus told us this parable. He played with children. He prayed for mourners. He talked to adulterers. He healed the sick to show them and to demonstrate and to explain, to live out our lives called by the kingdom of God. And by doing so, we grasp something about who God is for us. The parable of the tenants, it explains this lesson for today. In the parable of the tenants in the vineyards, in the account of the story, the three servants are sent um, an absentee owner in particular, back to the vineyards, to collect the charges for that tenant. And it is a gruesome story. It is a gruesome story. When we hear the details of it, that the three servants were beaten. They were thrown out. The landlord then decides to send his own son, his own son that gets killed. Let's stop right there. What's the point? Many of you have children. Would you send your children into a situation like that? No. What kind? Why? Why would this loving father, we have loving fathers out there, why would God send his son after seeing what happened before? Why is the landowner crazy? Can't he grasp the seriousness of the situation? And yet, and yet, 
It doesn't make any sense at all, does it? The son goes. And he gets killed. And even though it doesn't make sense, the God of creation, who sent the prophets of Israel and watched over them, and watched them be stoned, trying to show the people a better way, even though it doesn't make sense to us, God sent his son, and predictably, he gets killed. And we all shake our heads. Why would he do that? Why would God do such a foolish thing? And let me tell you this. It's because God loves you. It's because God loves you. And God loves his people. He loves all of his creation. And he took the risk to send Jesus to us. He put Jesus in the center of our sin. Even to be killed his own son, in the midst of hatred, pride, jealousy, arrogance, God still loves us. Does it make any sense? Jesus told this story. It seems foolish. It seems illogical. And yet he sent his son that truly God must love us. God still takes the risk with us today. He still sends us his son today. And he still calls us to be that accountable worker in the vineyard. And he continues to come to us in love. That we might learn to love one another someday. Someday. Perhaps the impact and the profoundness of God's grace and love and forgiveness will move us to the depths of a new life that he has offered for us. Someday, maybe, it might even be today. Amen.
this time we'll gather our offering. Together let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, May the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
the blessing of God Almighty, the wisdom and power of Christ Jesus, and the light of the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, remember the poor. Thanks be to God.